Welcome to the Military Justice Today podcast with your host, Robert Capovilla and Mickey Williams, covering the full range of military law topics from all branches of the armed forces. Today's episode is made possible in part by the law firm of Capovilla and Williams. And now let's welcome the hosts of the show, Rob and Mickey. All right, everybody, here we go. Another episode of Military Justice Today. I'm Matt Starosiak, stepping in momentarily before we get to our host and guest today. With me in the studio is Robert Capavilla. Nice to be with you, Robert. Good, Matt. That was a, an exceptionally enthusiastic introduction, so thank you. I try to be enthusiastic when I say your guy's name. I kind of draw out the <laughs> Robert and the Mickey as much as I can. I appreciate and it. And then I kind of go dead. But uh, it's great to be with you in the studio today. We also have a great guest um, with us today as well, attorney and former military judge Troy Smith. Troy, welcome to the show you know, it's always great to have a guest who is accomplished in one segment of the profession. Um, but it's even better when we have somebody who has great experience and, and has excelled, truly excelled in multiple positions. And I think, sir, that describes you perfectly. You, uh, you were a former or you were former New York City homicide prosecutor. You served as defense counsel in the Army JAG. You were a military judge for, I think, a couple decades um, you've participated in uh, hundreds of appellate cases, and you now have your own private practice in New York, where you, of course, work within the military courts and then also do defense work in the state courts and in the federal courts. So, Troy, uh, welcome to the show. It's great to have you with us today. Thanks, Matt. Hey, how are you doing, Rob? Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course, sir. It's, uh, it's uh, really great to have you on here. Uh, Last time I saw you, we were uh, in the heat of a courtroom when you were still a military (laughs) judge, and um, I thought that your bridging the gap was probably the best that I had been a part of as a litigator. Uh, So when I knew that you had retired, I wanted to jump on the opportunity to get you on here and talk about some of your philosophies um, with our our wonderful, dedicated listeners. I appreciate uh, the invite. I know Rob's got... A ton of questions. He's been talking about this episode for a number of weeks now. I know he's got a lot of questions, wants to talk with you about a number of things, including your time on the bench and kind of that transition. But I think the question that I have is, you know, out of all the things that you've done, and I think you've been doing this now uh, 30 years, what, what position that you held did you find to be the most challenging on a day to day? I can imagine that on any given day, You know, one could be more challenging than the other, but out of being the judge and a a homicide prosecutor, defense counsel, what position did you find most challenging on the regular? Definitely uh, being a military judge was uh, the most challenging. Um, There's always issues that uh, are unique that come up and uh, um, being able to uh, research and uh, make rulings and and uh, decisions has definitely been the most challenging. Yeah, it seems like a ton of responsibility when you're on the bench. It definitely is. It's very uh, professionally rewarding and personally rewarding, but it's uh, definitely very difficult and challenging. Well, I also had an opportunity to to take in your website, which is uh, jag-lawyer.com, and look at some of the material you had on there. Super interesting. You've been an expert commentator on a number of really high-profile cases. What was that like? I think uh, one of them I saw was the Casey Anthony trial and then also the George Zimmerman prosecution where they brought you in for your perspective. How was that? Uh, I had the chance to, um, one of my cases when I was a homicide prosecutor in the Bronx uh, back in, I want to say it was in around 2009, uh, CBS News uh, was uh, following the story on the homicide trial, and uh, I developed a relationship with uh, a a commentator from uh, CBS News, and he would call me up uh, at times um, to speak about, uh, give my professional opinions on the Casey Casey Anthony trial, George Zimmerman trial, as well as uh, others, so it's always... It's always, you, you know, it's not something that I get to do every day, and I enjoy doing it, and I've actually you know, pride myself on getting better at it. So, so it, it was definitely a great experience. 
So, Troy, I want to just switch gears here for a minute and talk just a bit more um, about your background. And in particular, I'm curious to how your path was to becoming a military judge. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a little bit unique to have somebody who's been, uh, for the most part, a dedicated defense attorney on the civilian side to become a military judge. How did how did you go from, you know, uh, prosecuting homicide cases um, to really, you know, developing as a defense attorney, and how did that lead to your time on the bench? Well, I was actually a defense attorney before I was ever a prosecutor. So I came into JAG Corps in, in 1994, and uh, my first duty station was at Fort Stewart. And all I wanted to do was be a uh, be a litigator, a criminal litigator. And I was told at the time that that path would always be starting with trial counsel. So I said, I want to be a trial counsel. And, of course, nobody listened to me, and they made me a legal assistance officer. And <laughs> right. I said, I, after after doing that for a little over a year, I said, hey, I want to be a trial counsel. I want to be a prosecutor. And nobody listened to me, and they said, you can be an administrative law officer. And I said, "That's this is not the way I want to go. And I was kept pushing it. And um, I was kind of kind of rare to become a TDS, trial defense service, before you become a trial counsel, but I did. So while I was at Fort Stewart, I became a trial defense counsel. I did that for uh, just about almost two years and incredibly busy jurisdiction. I probably had, I think I had 31 court marshals, and I want to say close to 10 of them were uh, contested panel cases, uh, serious, really serious uh, felonies and stuff like that. So uh, that was a really really great experience. And I PCS to uh, the government appellate division in uh, um, Northern Virginia, military district of Washington. I did that for three years. It was, you know, at first I, I don't know that I loved it, but I came to love it. Um, being on the appellate side, it was actually really interesting. And I, I think I wrote more than 100 briefs, and uh, I argued 30 plus cases before the Army Court of Criminal Appeals, and approximately 10 cases before the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces. And that was a really unique experience. Uh, I argued a complicated homicide case at West Point uh, before the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces in front of 500 cadets, which was really unique experience. And uh, I got to work a little bit. I was the lead counsel on United States versus Kreutzer, the capital case. The Army sent me um, capital litigation courses several times. There was a, it was a I I was assigned to that case almost from the beginning of my assignment, and the the case was still the defense still hadn't filed their appeal by the time I had left that position. So I, even though I'm on the brief, I own, I had some involvement in it, but I didn't get to take it through to the end, but that was a, a great experience. Uh, at the end of my time at the government appellate division, I decided it was, I was time to, uh, Enter the civilian sector. I left active duty. I immediately joined the Army Reserves. We stood up the 154th, uh, what was then the LSO, the 154th Legal Operations Detachment, the U.S. Army Trial Defense Service for the Reservists. And I became a prosecutor in the district attorney's office. And I, because I already had a significant level of experience, I was tr- trying serious felonies as a prosecutor. Probably, um, you know, within a, within less than a year uh, there, and then I was trying homicide cases within you know two or three years, and I became a homicide prosecutor exclusively, almost in the uh, Bronx District Attorney's Office. I was there for uh, for ten years, but that time was interrupted um, for two uh, tours uh, where I was mobilized. The first time I was mobilized to Fort Drum, New York in 2006, and I was the acting senior defense counsel from 2006 to 2008, where I had renewed my passion for being a uh, defense counsel, and um, there was a great amount of litigation experience as a TDS counsel there, and I did that for um, two years. And then I got I left active duty in 2008, and I came back to um, to being a Bronx district attorney. And and then in 2009, I was asked to uh, be the defense counsel at TDS counsel again at West Point. 
And uh, I basically did that for a year where I was going working at West Point and going up to Fort Drum and handling their backload as well. And when I left active duty, I decided it was time to start my own criminal law practice. And I've been doing that since 2010. And I have a very uh, busy criminal defense practice uh, where I handle every type of case, but I specialize in homicide defense. And uh, I'm also on the court-appointed panel for New York City, particularly in Bronx County, New York, where I'm carrying 15 homicide cases right now. Um, Wow. Yeah, so that's pretty busy. But uh, I became a judge in 2011, and that was not as a necessarily easy path. It was something I always believed I wanted to do. And it took me, I think it took me three tries, three straight years of trying to get it. And I finally was selected to become a judge in 2011. And that was amazing. It was absolutely incredible. I did that for for three years. And I then uh, was, it was time to move on to another assignment. And essentially um, in my last assignment, I knew I had about three years left um, before I would retire, and I was a I was a very fortunate to be selected for a second term um, as a, as a uh, military judge, and I spent three plus years as a military judge in the uh, second circuit. But I would handle a lot of cases in the first circuit as well, and um, that was an incredible experience, and I officially. Uh, My retirement was official on the 1st of December of 2022, Well, and that's essentially uh, it in a nutshell. Congratulations on the retirement, Troy. That's certainly well-earned. I mean, your breadth of experiences, uh, I mean, my my jaw almost dropped when I I heard the number of cases you've litigated, uh, your current caseload. Um, I'm actually from a, a family of Northeasterners myself. My father is... Uh, All right. Yeah, yeah. My dad is a... I could... Go ahead. Go ahead. I couldn't tell by your accent. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, and you see me in person. I'm a five foot seven and a half Italian guy. Um, nice. And uh, dad was from a small town called Emerson, New Jersey. Uh, grandpa owned a uh, fishing store up there. Um, they would go out and uh, and uh, deep sea fish, and he'd sell those fish as he hit retirement. And then my mom is actually born in Queens. So I, I hear you say the Bronx a lot. I have a very important question for you. Arguably, the most important question I'm going to ask you on this podcast: Are you Absolutely. a Yan- are you a Yankee or a Met fan? I am a Yankee fan, but I am uh, more more importantly, I am a tortured, long suffering New York Jets fan, <laughs> and uh, that is a season ticket holder. And I have the curse of making my kids both. Uh, New York Jet fans, but I am a, is actually a, a story to why I'm a Yankee fan, and I'm going to tell it very quickly. My father is a Brooklyn Dodger fan. He grew up in Brooklyn, and the Dodgers left, and he became a Mets fan. And I, when I started following baseball in 1976, the Yankees were in three straight World Series, 76 to 78, and my father was watching the Yankees because they were a much better product than the last place Mets, and I just started becoming a Yankee fan. And then all of a sudden, the Mets became great in the, in the 80s, and I'm like, what's going on here? I didn't understand, but I was already a Yankee fan. It was too late. My uh, my my grandfather is from a place called Flushing, New York. I think is what it's called. And of he, course, yeah, he, yeah, that's that's where the Mets play. Yeah, and he actually grew up a uh, a New York Giants fan. And uh, that's unusual. I, yeah, and I get my love uh, of baseball from him. Um, and he got to see Willie Mays play in person, which is pretty incredible. That's uh, yeah. That is amazing. Yeah, that's it's certainly one guy I would have loved to see him play. Anyway, I see Matt over here starting to get his face is getting red. He's he's giving me the look like we've had enough baseball talk. Um, so, I could talk all day about it, but we probably we should probably move on. <laughs> Troy, it's hard as the moderator of this great podcast. Sometimes I gotta, <laughs> you know, especially Rob with baseball. The man loves baseball. I I actually took him absolutely to uh to a wood bat tournament this weekend, and he saw his old childhood team. Oh, neat. I've never seen him happier in my life than when he he saw the Cincinnati jerseys out there on the field. But um, but I love I your, love it. Your background is phenomenal. It's I saw Rob's face light up a couple of times when you were mentioning the different positions you held. Um, that really is it's really a phenomenal career. And obviously, you're, it doesn't sound like you're anywhere near done at this point 
with your current caseload. Um, I'm going to jump in here with a question that I know Rob's going to kind of go back to some of the stuff the, having to do with best practices in, in the trial and in the courtroom. But um, what do you think the skills are that, that a person like you has that allow you to, to kind of transfer into these different positions successfully and to excel in them? I mean, is it is there a roster of, you know, things like dedication and commitment and or, or is it something different for you? A lot of guys don't, don't want to toot their own horn, but if you were to advise somebody or, or look for somebody who you think could do those things well, what would you look for in them? Well, I guess... I have to go back to when I wanted to first become a litigator and I was in, I was somewhat disappointed. No, no offense to the ad law attorneys out there. Um, when I got trans, when I got moved from legal assistance to administrative law, I was, I was disappointed. And I remember just having, um, the, uh, rules for court martial and the manual for court martial. And I just remember, you know, just, in every down minute I had just going over reading them and just trying to understand them. And that's where I, and I, that's where I, I, I just uh, started to, you know, and I think you need to know your rules. You need to know your mil, your rules, military rules of evidence. Um, you need to, and not just know your rules of evidence and understand, understand that. Um, and then you can have all that knowledge and it really doesn't make it, you know, it really doesn't amount to all that much until you get into the courtroom and, and you practice and, you, and you're doing it. Because when I, my, my experience, you know, my very first court martial ever as a TDS, I, I, I got an acquittal and it was somewhat in spite of me um, because <laughs> I'm not the litigator, you know, the litigator I'm today is not the litigator I was back in when I got that acquittal in 1995. And um, I thought I was like, oh, wow, this is amazing. And then I had another contested court martial two or three weeks later, and I fell flat on my face, and it was a conviction. And it was a case I could have, you know, I, prob- I probably could have won if I did a better job. So, you know, but it really just took, you know, uh, you know, it, it took a lot of, you don't just show up and become a great litigator. It takes a lot of a lot of work, a lot of practice, a lot of preparation. I think preparation is is really you know incredible. That that's that's the key. It's prep preparation. Besides, obviously you have to get experience, but being prepared is is incredibly important. So you know you have to have you have to have that drive and that passion and willingness to put in the long hours outside of court because you don't just show up at court and it doesn't just happen. It's you know you have to. You have to prepare, and, and that's a lot of work. It, it absolutely is a lot of work. Um, my law partner Mickey, who I'm not sure you've you've had a pleasure of meeting, he he says all the time in the office that trial is is he enjoys the experience as do I. It's game day. It's it's when all the fireworks happen. And, and to, despite the fact that you have a client that's going through a hard time, and you know likely an alleged victim or somebody on the other side that's going through a hard time, it really is an exciting experience. Whereas he says all the time, I love trial, but the preparation, my goodness, it wears you out. And if you're doing it right, the preparation will. You know, the preparation is the key. It, you know, you've got to make sure you're thorough about that. I thought that was well said. Um, with that being said, Troy, let's let's talk a little at bit. At the risk, let me just let me yeah, can yeah, I just yeah. say one thing. Of course, yeah. At, at the risk of at the risk of getting Matt a little uh, bothered about baseball analogies, <laughs> but I like to tell I like to I like to tell people that uh, I wish I could I wish I could pitch for the Yankees. I can't. I'm too old. I'm not good at baseball. Having trials in my life is my way of having competitive sports. Okay, but it's not always in my client's best interest to go to trial. But you know, when my client wants to go to trial, I'm I'm more than happy to. You know, but. Um, yeah, so happy to have you segue now. <laughs> yeah, I I, uh, I I share your sentiment there. Um, you know, I feel the same way. I'm a competitive person, like it sounds like you are, and we obviously have the best interests of our client at the forefront of every decision we make. But there is there are a few things in life that get my heart going and my blood pumping the way a pat courtroom does on the day you close a case. And um, I hope that's of something course. that I never get over. It, it, it has never changed from the first trial I've had there at Fort, uh, Fort Moore prior, you know, previously Fort Benning to now. All right, Troy, we have a lot of listeners who um, are, are, are litigators in the JAG Corps. We have a lot of listeners who are litigators in the civilian world. Um, and I want to talk about some best practices. I want to keep it casual. I want, you know, to, to kind of just, 
talk basically about some good practices that you've seen that you employ, not so much academic, but more, hey, you know, here's here's how you can here's how you can win a case or be successful in a case at this particular stage. Let's let's start with the voir dire process. Um, obviously, voir dire is is how some folks pronounce it. Maybe my Midwestern roots are are shown too much here, but you know. Um, what advice do you have to that young defense attorney in the army, that young prosecutor in the army about handling that process in the military where it tends to be a bit restricted? One of the things that frustrate me most is, is what dear or what dire, however you want to say it is, is I feel like defense counsel and trial counsel, but I'll speak to defense counsel, defense counsel. It's a throwaway. They don't, they don't really for the most part, they're not really thinking that much about it. And I can't stand when I get the questions, the voir dire questions, and I'm usually just getting, you know, one sentence questions. And I like to, if you probably remember from trying to case with me, Rob, I, I think I gave everybody a do over and I said, Hey, I understand some, some military judges won't let you do any voir dire somehow or have a lot of control over it. Uh, I want you uh, to, you know, take some chances here and, and to expand your, yourself a little bit. And, and actually, I gave, I think I probably gave it when I was talking to you guys in, in the court martial. I gave you an example as a defense example, and uh, I used an example of, you know, the military judge has instructed you that uh, an accused has a right to remain silent or a right not to testify, and you can't hold that against them. Does everybody agree to follow that instruction? And everybody here said yes. And I don't dispute that everybody can follow that instruction, but I'd like to submit to you, members of the panel, that's a little bit different than the way we live our everyday lives. And uh, I like to use an example. Um, Sergeant Major Jones, uh, you indicated that in your in your flyer that you have, I'm sorry, in your packet questionnaire that you have uh, three kids. Um, what would you do if you came home from uh, from a long day um, and you saw that there was a broken dish in the kitchen and uh, you said to your children, hey, what happened here? Tell me what happened. I want to know what happened now. What would you do if your kids looked at you and said, mom, dad, I have a right to remain silent and you can't hold my silence against me. And every, usually the panel is, is laughing and chuckling. You can't hold my silence against me. And in fact, not only can't you hold it against me, but you have to prove my guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. And I don't have any burden here. The burden never shifts. And what are you going to say to your kid? Not in my, not in my house. The rules of court don't really apply like that. And one, it kind of lightens the mood a little bit. And, you know, two, shows your personality a little bit, but also you're getting them to, you know, to think a little bit and to, and to, and to talk a little bit. And you're, you're able to, you know, to, to be able to get there. So what I'd like to try to tell counsel is that it's, you win and lose your case in voir dire and opening statement. And that if you do a poor job in voir dire and opening statement, you're likely not going, not going to prevail. Okay. Obviously you got to have the evidence on your side. You know, you got to have favorable evidence, but in a case where it's a close call, if you're doing a great job on voir dire and, and getting it out there and doing a great job in uh, your opening statement, you're, you're, that's that's a very big key to success. Troy, uh, Rob has a massive smile on his face right now because he has said nice. those exact words about, uh, I'm going to call Vordire too because I went to law school in Houston, but uh, Vordire and opening statements, him and Mickey have said the exact same thing on other podcasts. So he's here nodding and smiling as you're saying those are the, the key parts to the trial and hard to recover, obviously, Excellent. if you don't do those well. So, Troy, Absolutely. Troy, let's say you're at the voir dire stage. The, the investigation's complete, obviously. Your defense team has interviewed the witnesses, and you're ready for trial. And let's say you've got a theory of defense that the alleged victim is lying about uh, what happened with your client because her and your client are in the middle of a custody battle, right? You've got that concrete motive to fabricate. Do you... How do you introduce that during voir dire, um, and do you make a point to introduce that during voir dire? So I'm not going to hit your exact 
point right now I, because it would take me some time to really formulate it. Sure. All right. Because I know most judges are going to not want me to do that. Okay. They're going to say that, um, what dire, what dear is not your chance to, it's not an opening statement. It's not your chance to get your theory of your case across. And my argument would be your honor. This is not about getting my theory of the case across, even though it probably is in part, but it's also about <laughs> to determine whether somebody can be fair and impartial. And if you have evidence, uh, you know, you want to, you know, you'd want to know, you know, can, can they consider that? Um, but I probably would spend a lot of time. When I say a lot of time, I'd say, you know, a few, a couple hours trying to see if I could tailor your, Rob, your, your scenario to bring something to the table in my voir dire. Okay. But what I generally do is I, I, I will use an example to show credibility, uh, during voir dire, um, because in, in a lot of my cases, and a lot of my cases are in the civilian world where um, it's dealing with police officers, and obviously you have CID and MPs, and uh, they're capable of making mistakes. They're capable of not telling the truth either. Um, so it, it applies as well. So I use an, ex- an example I often use will be, um, you know, late members of the panel, a military judge has instructed you that uh, he is the judge of the uh, law and you are the judge of the facts and it's your role to determine credibility. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll, and the judge has also instructed you about uh, law enforcement test or may instruct you about law enforcement. You can't give any greater weight or lesser weight to law enforcement um, by virtue of them just being a law enforcement a- agent. Um, what would you do if uh, imagine a scenario where I, I get I was coming to court and I got pulled over for speeding and a police and a CI and an MP came into court and said that he pulled me over, that I was going 50 miles an hour in a in a 30 mile per hour zone and he said he had me on radar, came in testified put, put his hand on the Bible swore to tell the truth nothing but the truth, and you agree with me, uh, Colonel Clink. You have uh, you would have no reason to necessarily doubt him just based on that alone. He has me on radar, um, fifty and a thirty, right? Yeah. Now, Colonel Clink, what would you do if uh, if you found out that the radar detector malfunctioned? Well, it's an honest mistake. Yeah, of course. Now, uh, Major Major Jones, if you found out that Colonel that if you found out that the MP actually didn't never turn the radar detector on and he was misrepresenting, then you would agree with me, you'd have a problem with that testimony, right? You would have a problem with that. You know, he's clearly, he's clearly lying. And if there was a, and I might throw in something about a civilian witness. Um, if there was a civilian witness that, um, that came into court and, uh, you know, the civilian witness you found out was, um, was intoxicated, you know, you would necessarily like evaluate, you know, the fact that they were under the influence when they, you know, when, when the incident happened or whatever the incident is. And if you found out that they had, you know, let's say they had a personal relationship with the police officer or some, or something, or a personal relationship with something. Again, uh, this is something I would, I would think about, um, you know, in preparation, but I would maybe figure out a way to tie it into what you're asking me, Rob. And like I said, I would just need some time to put it together, but that's kind of where I would probably go with it. Yeah. So, I mean, the bottom line is getting, you know, hitting those, those themes to the extent that you can early in that process is, is, is an important one. Let's, let's transition now to opening. What are some basic foundational principles, um, for how you handle opening statements? What are some good practices you've seen, uh, in the courtroom that you wouldn't, you would, you could pass along to, um, some of the folks that might be having an opening statement listening to the show here relatively soon? Like I said, voir dire and opening statements, that's your, that's your, that's the most important, in my opinion, the most important phase of the trial. If you, if you don't do those well and you're in a case where the evidence is, is at least I'll call it close, you know, it's, it's very important, important that you prepare it, um, that you are, pa- I would say passionate. I like an opening statement that right off the bat gets my attention and not, I, I'll, I'll cite a recent um, homicide trial I had where my client shot an unarmed man. Sh- I'm sorry. My client shot um, a gentleman from behind 
and the guy, the, the victim had a gun on him, but he never, it was in on his person. He never pulled it out. And I was in my trial. I had evidence where the victim came up to my client a few days before the homicide while my client was with his teenage son, his 13 year old son and said, the next time I see you, I don't care if your kid is with you, you're going to be dead. And he showed him his gun. And I was able to show that this guy was, you know, targeting my guy and my guy, instead of, you know, it's, it's a different world in the, in the South Bronx. And instead of calling the police, he took matters into his own hands and, and it's not right. So, uh, I channeled my inner, um, Arnold Schwarzenegger Terminator line. <laughs> and, uh, I started, I started out and I just looked at the jury and the prosecutor who's actually I'm friends with. I have a good relationship with. He had no idea what he thought I was going. He, he really thought I was going to go that they got the wrong guy. It was a mistake. And I, that somebody else did it. And I like, and I, I, I shocked him and I kind of, I kind of kept it in, in suspense. I ne- I didn't even reveal it in, in voir dire what, what I was doing. And I just, and I, I just, I won't say I ambushed him, but I, I, uh, he didn't know until my opening statement where I was heading. And I just, I, like I said, I, cha- I channeled my inner Arnold and I looked at the pa- of the jury and I just said, he will not stop coming after you until you are dead, which of course is a Terminator line. And that's was my theory of the case that this guy would not stop coming after him until he was dead. And he felt that there's only in a, in a, a situation in New York city, um, in a really bad area where the, not every, no people don't necessarily trust cops. It's, um, it became, you know, it was either he either took care of it or he was going to wind up dead and maybe his kid would wind up dead. And, and it was, I don't know if the prosecutor was, he still like, like, he still like talks about it this day. It was the most powerful opening statement he's ever seen. So, uh, I, I, I that, that's just my practice. Um, and I like that. I like that when so when a, when a, someone that's before me is when I'm a judge and they, you know, they, they catch my attention right off the bat and it ca- definitely caught the jury's attention. And that's, and, and I, I had a big, I had a big, um, Rico conspiracy, um, murder and furtherance of a Rico conspiracy trial in the Southern district of New York. And it was a God awful case for my client. There were multiple cooperators and there was, there was mountains and mountains of evidence against my client. But, um, and I essentially knew I had very no chance whatsoever. And my client wanted to go to trial cause he was facing a life sentence either way. And, um, I, I remember, I gave a powerful statement and opening, like just like I did. I don't remember exactly what it was, but the um, there was a, qu- a ju- there was a jury note, something about they wanted to hear what I what, what the, the statement was. I said in my opening statement that they recall that I like, wanted to hear it again, <laughs> something <laughs> like that. So it was pretty pretty cool. That's a good <laughs> that, that's a good so, sign that that uh, had a had an impact yeah. on them for sure. That's the kind of thing yeah, you like. Absolutely, um, absolutely. Oh, okay, so. Um, you know, you handle Vort Dyer, uh, opening statements. I, I agree. I've oftentimes said those are the two most important moments in a trial. And then typically I say, you know, right there uh, and perhaps as important is the cross-examination of the alleged victim. Um, obviously, you know, Troy, a lot of my work is sexual assault. So we'll use the, the alleged victim terminology here. Um, what are some... You know, what are some pointers or, uh, you know, some thoughts you have about what makes an effective opening statement? And I guess, Troy, I'd be I'd be I would be interested to hear your view from the bench on this, because I've never sat behind. I've never been a judge. And sometimes when I hear crosses of, of counsel, I don't always know what the heck they're talking about. It's not organized properly. There's no real chapters. You know, there, there's not that organizational arc to it. So really from a position of a military judge, you know, what, what do you look for in those good cross examinations? What makes a good cross examination? So I'll just say one of the game changers for me was in 2007 when I was mobilized to Fort Drum, the army sent me to the greatest conference I've ever been involved in, which was the TDS conference in Walt Disney world. And Besides being a lot of fun, uh, they brought in a guest lecturer, uh, uh, Posner and Dodd, um, mm-hmm. 
and we got to see a several hour lecture uh, from Posner about his um, his uh, cross examination, and he talked primarily about his book, The Science and Techniques, and he showed us his his chapter method, and I was blown away by it. I thought it was amazing. And I immediately bought the book, and I recommend that counsel um, make that purchase if they don't already have it, Cross-Examination, Science and Techniques by Dodd and Posner, and, and read it. And um, I won't, I, I won't, I don't use it um, 100%. I put my own take on it. I put my own spin on it. I think, Rob, you and I have talked about this. I think you do as well. You, you know, you... Right. You know, if you if you did everything the way Posner did it, you you probably would your cross your cross examination of a witness might go from uh, two hours to twenty hours. <laughs> That's right. Um, <laughs> so you know, so I think you got to move on at some point. But it's really great the way he organizes it and really breaks it down. And that, and really, what it's about is about taking those hours. So let's say you have a cross examination that lasts. I'm just going to use the number two hours. Okay. So a good you know. You probably have to prepare ten times that to to do that cross examination. I'm going to say twenty hours, if not if not if not more. All right, and that's really what you know. That's really what it's about. And you know, if if you have, you know, I'm assuming like she's the 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 alleged victim has been interviewed by CID, and you have her um, interview you. You really just need to like dedicate yourself to like listening and rewinding and listening and rewinding, and you got to take really detailed notes because in in a, a successful cross examination is about finding inconsistent statements, and the more you can find, the better. And some are incredibly important, and some are not really important. But I, you know, if if a client, if a if a person a witness says it was the day of the crime, it was a sunny day, uh, testifies, let's say at a thirty-two hearing, which we don't have anymore. Which you know, don't get me started on that. <laughs> right. And um, <laughs> you know, and um, then they testify at the court martial that it wasn't that it was a uh, it was snowing out. Well, you know, how do you get you know one is one is sunny and one is snowing, and obviously you know that that's a a, a strange example, but you know, you, you, you know what I'm talking about, you know, when, so you listen to the, to the, the tapes of the interview, cause you're not going to have, you're not going to have an article 32 transcript anymore, uh, which is, you know, like I said, don't get me started on that one. Yep, I understand. So really it comes down to like having, having the CID interview. And sometimes you might even have like, um, if, if civilian law enforcement has the case initially, there might be something in an interview and, uh, you know, and, and that's, that's actually is potential gold where you have a civilian interview and then you have a CID interview and you bounce them off each other and you could see inconsistencies in them. So, and now, so now, and then if you get them a trial and they're inconsistent from that, but you gotta be really, really diligent, say like where the witness said, you know, this something happened at the 32 minute mark and 15 seconds. And you got to have those notes, you know, another practice. If, if you're, you know, I don't know if, if your T, if your TDS counsel, maybe you could get it funded, but if you know, you're most, most of the, you know, if you're a civilian defense counsel, you're probably gonna have to, you know, this is going to be something that would have to be done out of pocket, getting it transcribed. Um, is another is another way to go, but if you're not going to do a transcribe, you got to really just you got to really just listen and and take really good notes, and and you got to know exactly where your timestamps are. Yep. And you know, just being and and that's that's Matt because when the witness says that, I go, do you remember uh, giving a statement um, previously to CID? Yeah, and you and you gave that uh, two days after this happened. Yeah, and you agree with me your memory was better than when it happened. Do you remember telling CID? that um this happened and the witness says oh, i don't remember that well you know then you or you remember i don't remember saying that i don't believe i said that or whatever it is or the witness admits to saying it and then it becomes a little um you know it's not exactly artful um that's why i like having the um 
if you have the transcript, if you have the transcript, like if you've made, if you've already gotten it, it's easier. You can, sh- you can show the witness the transcript, but if you only have the, the audio recording, most, most of the time the judge is going to require you to, to let the witness hear it outside the presence of the members. Cause it's not being offered for the truth of the matter asserted. And, um, you know, that's how you, right. You can either show an inconsistency or, or refreshing the witness's recollection. But really, I mean, that's, that's really what it comes down to. It's a good, you know, you don't have to be, you don't have to be like a Hollywood actor kind of, you know, fantastic, you know, court presence, whatever, to, to do a good cross examination. Okay. You know, I, I, if you spend the time preparing and getting it ready, um, you can, you can really do a successful cross. That's really what it comes down to. Nope. And, I, I you know, agree. Just, go ahead. Go ahead. And one of the other things is, um, you gotta, I see defense counsel asking non-leading questions and I'm like, there's, there's a limited time when to do that, but why, you know, you got to ask yourself, why are you doing that? Like right. if, and if it's for an, if you know, that if you know, then, and Posner actually talks about that. It's like, if you know, that there's only one way they can answer it. Okay. But you know, why give them an next, you know, give them, let them, you know, ask them a yes or no question. And then also dealing with, you know, there's so many different, as you know, there's so many different, you never know how a cross is going to go. You never know how the witness is going to react. Okay. You, you, sometimes you're going to have the compliant witness. Sometimes you're going to have the forgetful witness. Sometimes you're going to have the non-compliant witness that refuses to answer your questions. Yes or no. And that's why I also recommend, you know, you know, this takes a lot of work, but especially when you have a non-compliant witness that's refusing to answer your questions. Yes or no. And wants to give a long winded answer. You know, there's, you know, there's techniques for dealing with that and, you know, just comes with practice. Right. I, 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 I made it a, a habit in our practice the last two or three years to get the certified transcript done because it makes things so much easier when it comes to yeah. the art of impeachment. Plus, I, you know, it's a running joke in my office that CID or OSI or NCIS does it on purpose. But the quality of the audio is always so terrible that even if you are able oh, to yeah. successfully impeach, the audio is so bad. I, I, I learned early on where I had an alleged victim say, oh, I don't understand that. I don't understand that. I can't hear it clearly. I can't hear it clearly. And the judge is looking at me and I'm looking at the judge, you know, and it's like, oh, geez. Um, so we just get the, the darn thing transcribed. But I want to move on. I, I think those were some awesome how do you, how do you get how do you, how, do you, how do you get it certified? Yeah, so I actually use a company that is um, – so the Army doesn't do this. The Air Force doesn't do this. But the Navy requires um, or at least has a practice that all recorded interviews be transcribed. And I think it was born out of this idea because NCIS records almost every interview, whereas the Army and OSI primarily focus on the alleged victim, right? So they have a contract with a company – I can't think of the name right now, even though I've used them a hundred times, but they're contracted with the Navy. So they're very familiar with NCIS, CID, that kind of thing. And they will actually do a certified transcript for you. Um, And it is, uh, you know, it's changed my practice. I mean, you know, you know, as well as I do, like it's, it's a tremendously helpful. Um, And I recommend, yeah, I mean, I recommend any JAG listening to this on the defense side, you know, I know that TDS money is relatively slim these days, but uh, try to get some things transcribed. It makes your life so much easier. Um, Okay. Of course. Client, you know, for me, I, I've always, I, I, you know, opening statement and closing argument are things that come relatively easy to me because I like to talk, right? But um, cross-examination, like you said, you never know how it's going to go. It's nerve wracking, all that kind of stuff. Memorize, you know, knowing your rules, like the back of your hand is key, but I would say the times in trial that cause me the most stress, anxiety, that I'm sweating the most, that I'm the most nervous is when we, you know, I call my client and I am an advocate of calling clients. Um, you know, obviously it's case dependent. Some folks stay away from it, you know, uh, uh, like it's the plague. I've never embraced that. I've always, I've always thought that if you have the right kind of client, calling them to stand can be powerful. So what are some best practices for how you prep your clients to take the stand? 
Yeah, so I definitely don't avoid it like the plague, but I have a general rule that if I think I can pr- win my case without my client testifying, I'm going to do that 99% of the time. Um, but that, that's an evaluation. Um, it is, um, it is tailored somewhat that philosophy in a court martial setting because try to remember most of my clients in my civilian practice are not choir boys and, sure. uh, they're, you know, they're, they're a lot of times they have a criminal record and already, you know, and they've been in, in prison and, uh, opens the door to a can of worms. But in the military, you know, most of our guys are, are, are a lot of times they're just good people. They're good kids. Maybe they, you know, got caught up in a bad situation, you know? So, um, but it is, you know, but it's something I have, I definitely have to have to weigh. So it's, it's a little unique in the, what what's different about the court martial setting versus my civilian setting is my trials take in the mil in the civilian setting usually take about a month. Okay, right. it's, it's really a really slow process, and the beauty of that is my client gets to hear everything, and, and he's present for you know he's present for the entire month, and he gets to see the the feel and the flow of everything. And and I'll start, you know, if I've made that decision to prep to, to have my guy test, well, my clients made that decision based on my advice. Um, I'll I'll begin prepping him, you know, normally, you know, um, as we get towards the end of the, the prosecution's case, which is very different than how I'll handle a court martial setting. I already know in a court martial if my guy's testifying before right. we even begin. All right, right. I, it's already it's already a, it's already a decision that's been made. And a lot of times, actually, in the civilian setting, I know it too. I said, look. I'm like you've got a self defense case. The only the only one that can argue that can make that can get the judge for me to even give the instru- you know the instructions on self defense is for you to to reasonably raise it through your testimony. There's no other evidence to support it. So the only way to do that is you testify. So I tell that to my client even beforehand, before we even begin you know jury selection. So sort of like the same thing with a court martial. Like I know I know ahead of time, and and I'm I'm somewhat preparing even before before we're going because I'm getting I'm I'm getting to know him, I'm getting his background, I'm learning all about him because I'm also not I'm not just preparing him for for testimony, but if the if the court martial goes south, I wanna know all his, you know, E and M and being able to put him up there in, in sentencing and stuff. So I wanna know all about his background and um uh, you know, but I wanna hear what he has to say and and I'm loosely you know, I'm loosely preparing him, um, you know, in the, I don't know, I'll say a week or week or so beforehand. And as we get, you know, a couple of days beforehand, I'll probably, in a court martial setting, I'll probably spend several hours with him, you know, discussing what I believe are going to be his testimony. And in a, in a, in a good setting, you know, I don't know. When I when I was practicing back in the nineties, it seemed every single court martial would, would go till two o'clock in the morning and it would end the same day. A lot of times now I feel like will you will like even if the government's case will go in and will you a lot of times have the defense case the following morning in the worst case scenario a lot of times. So I'll have that evening to be able to work with my client and, and talk to him and, and prepare him and also, you know, I I tr- I, I, I either me or somebody else in my office, you know, somebody else that I trust that's a very skilled uh, attorney will, will pretend to be the prosecutor and do a cross examination right. of the, uh, of the client. And, um, and maybe sometimes even a better idea to have somebody else do it, a different perspective than me. Um, and, you know, prepare. And a lot of times my clients say, wow, your cross examination of me was harder than the prosecutors, which is, you know, that's what you want to hear. That, absolutely. So that's the, yeah, so that's and you got and I you know especially with things like opening the door, you know, to certain things, you got to be careful with your client and you know preparing them and make sure that they're you know it's all about preparation. It's just like the same thing, you know. It it's preparing a good direct examination, but it's it's a lot of in some ways it's similar to preparing for cross examination. You're you you're you got to you know you got to work at it. You got to prep. You don't just show up and do it. So Troy, Matt is giving me the eye, and he's holding up a sign saying we're we're just about at time, 
And uh, given the fact I have to, I spend almost as much time with Matt as I do my wife, I do strive to keep Matthew happy. Um, <laughs> nice. <laughs> so we're going to jump into my last question, and maybe other than what baseball team you root for, I think this is the second most important question. If my old man, uh, Craig Capavilla was still around, he would say this is the most important question, uh, because certainly my dad spent a lot of time in Cincinnati after leaving the East Coast talking about how he can't get good Italian food or good pizza anywhere. Um, nice. So, yeah, so... You got a, you got somebody going to the city for the first time. They want to try that famous New York Italian food or some of that famous pizza. Give a give us a place or two that um, has the recommendation of the Honorable Troy Smith. Well, this is way off the beaten path. My you know my staple for solid Italian is actually near where I grew up. I grew up in Queens, actually, and right on the border of Long Island. And the, my opinion, the best pizza in New York City and the best chicken parmesan and Big Z ricotta is uh, at a place called Ancona's, A-N-C-O-N-A-S. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's hardly fancy. It's definitely not. It's, uh, you could eat there. You could take it out. And um, it's, I highly recommend it if you're in that area. And um, that's somewhere I would eat almost every single Friday night of my entire life growing up. And I, when I have it, my parents still live near there. And when I go out there, I make it a point to stop by there. So that's my recommendation. Well, I mean, no disrespect to the folks that I live with on a daily basis here in Georgia and the South. Um, and there is a couple good, there are a couple good Italian places uh, in Georgia. They're few and far between. But when you mention chicken parmesan, you know, down here in this part of the country, chicken parmesan, they think it's fried chicken with some marinara on it uh, and, 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 mm-hmm. some, and some mozzarella. And I go back to uh, Marie Capavilla's chicken parmesan that I grew up with and um you just don't find that kind of stuff down here my friend <laughs> absolutely and, and I'll actually give you a quick a little tip and next time you have a case at Fort Stewart make sure you go to Savannah uh, the best pizza uh, in my opinion south of the Mason Dixon line is at a place called uh, Vinnie Van Gogo's it's in City Market pizza is excellent it was a staple I ate it every single weekly uh from three year my three year station there it's delicious well, I'm down there in just about uh, two weeks. I'm going to take you up on that. And um, I, I know our, our time here is done, but I just want to say, sir, how much I appreciate you giving us the time. You're a wealth of knowledge. Once again, congratulations on your retirement. And I'll turn it over to uh, to Matthew to close us out here. Thanks, Thanks Rob. Rob. Thank you, Matt. Of course. Yeah, Troy, I echo that as well. Thank you for your service to our country. Congratulations on your retirement. Um Rob is 100% right about the Italian food and, in particular, the pizza down here in Georgia. I'm from the Detroit area, and we've yet to find a decent pizza here. No offense to anybody Absolutely. in that business, but it's once you're used to something really good, it's it's hard to find it. But um, but thank you so much again for your time today. I thought it was great. I love the the create the the creativity you talked about in almost every aspect of the trial that we covered today. It was always about being creative, giving examples. And I think our listeners are going to love that. So we appreciate you being on. Let me give your contact information one more time. Your website is, is jag lawyer.com or jag hyphen lawyer.com. The number they can reach you at your office is 914-358-1433. And, uh, and again, enormous uh, gratitude to you, for your appearance on the podcast today. We'd love to have you back. I don't think we got through as much on closing arguments as we would have liked to, so maybe we can have you back to talk about that on a future show. But, uh, again, congratulations. Thank you for being here, and uh, thank you for your service. Thanks, gentlemen. It was a pleasure. And Look forward to being on again. Yes, for sure. We will absolutely set that up. To our listeners, thank you again. Another episode of Military Justice Today. This is Matt Starosiak for... Robert Capavilla and Troy Smith. Everybody take care and be safe. Thanks for listening to the Military Justice Today podcast with your hosts, Robert Capavilla and Mickey Williams. This show was made possible in part by the law firm of Capavilla and Williams. For more information or to listen to more episodes, visit militaryjusticetoday.com.